$1 million in less than three years. This is how I did it from start to finish. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, welcome. My name's Miles and this channel is all about accelerating your Amazon FBA journey from zero to six or seven figures like I've been able to do. So today I wanted to share my story and my background of how I was able to become a millionaire by the age of 29. So I'm, I'm 29 now, turning 30 soon. And in the last couple of years, I've started an Amazon FBA business, grown that up to selling around three and a half million dollars. But obviously there's a lot more to it than just saying, well, I sold this much, so now I'm worth this much. You have to take away all of your expenses, all of the costs of goods sold, taxes, basically the costs of doing business before you can say that I'm actually worth a million dollars. So I'm gonna walk you through that step-by-step step, exactly what I did. And I'm going to include all of my income sources because Amazon is one, but it's not the only one. And I want you to have the whole picture. I know that most of these, you know, how I became a millionaire online type videos, they're either deliberately vague or they don't really go anywhere. And basically by the end of watching the video, you're still kind of just left wondering, well, like what did they do? So I'm gonna start from the start and I'm gonna walk you through what I did step-by-step, step, the mistakes I made, the things that I did right to get to where I am today. So I wanna just basically share this with you, be real. Um, and show you what my pathway looked like to get there. Again, the things that I did right and the things that I did wrong. And hopefully to show you guys what a potential pathway could look like for you too. If you have a similar goal, if you wanna be a millionaire um, by a certain age or a multimillionaire, or even if it's a smaller goal, it doesn't matter. I just wanna help you think about how you can get there for yourself. So let's start um, right at the start when I was a kid. And that's not starting from zero, by the way. Like everybody starts from somewhere. You have a family, you have friends, you have some sort of environment. And that environment is gonna push you in a certain direction or it's gonna pull you back from a certain direction. And I'm grateful to say that I had a decent start. So my family raised me well, they gave me a good education. Um, and actually education was always like a big focus for my family. They didn't have that much money, my mom and my dad, um, but allowing me to get an education was always a priority because both my mom and my dad had both tried to study and, and they'd been studying university degrees, but neither of them were able to finish. And so it was like a, it was a thing for them that I should be given that opportunity when they hadn't had it. But really I was just a kid growing up in a middle-class family. And I don't want you to think that I'm some business superstar guru. Like I learned this from nothing. Nobody in my family had ever, you know, run businesses or done well with money basically. But anyway, nothing that I did as a teenager when I was young, when I was still in school, um, took me towards any of those steps towards ever actually having that million dollar net worth. I basically just wanted to play video games and paint Warhammer figurines. So I started working my first jobs only after I'd finished high school. So I was 17, turning 18, it was the summer, um, just before I went to university. And my very first job was working data entry in a warehouse. So I would go in, work three to four hour shifts, four days a week. And the data that I was actually entering were these paper voting ballots. So I don't know how it's done elsewhere in the world, but in Australia you have this big long paper form. And basically when you vote to elect people, you write the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, in order of preference. And I was the kid that would take those numbers from the paper ballot and then just type them into the computer. And I got really good at using the numpad on the keyboard. So that's what I did basically until I quit because it sucked. And I just remember looking you know, across and I'd be sitting every day and there'd be this 45 year old man sitting to the right of me and he'd been doing the same job for years. And I just, I couldn't understand how you could do that at the time. But anyway, I was doing it too. So I, I quit that job and I got my second job, which was a telemarketer in a call center. And I was actually trying to get people, I was calling people up and trying to get them to donate money to a charity. And that was another crappy job that sucked. And it sucked because most of the money that I would get from these people when I called them up cold calling, um, most of that money would just go back to me. It wasn't even really going to the charity. So that was pretty much a swing and a miss as well, but at least I was saving money. And that was my only real goal at that point was just, just you know, get some sort of income happening. But again, at the end of the day, I was just clocking in hours, um, doing something that I didn't enjoy doing for the money, trading my time for money. And so I had that sort of imprinted on me and that's what all my friends did as well, that that was how you work is you just trade your time for money you're doing something that you don't enjoy and that's what work is it's something that you don't enjoy that pays you money okay so for all intents and purposes at this stage i'm at zero still right um so i would earn money and then spend it on something like i would buy a new computer or i would just basically consume something and use up that money and be back at zero except i'd enrolled in university so actually i was at minus twenty thousand. so since i'm still at zero or less than zero right now let's just call all of that phase zero and let's move on to so I enrolled in mining engineering at UNSW. Good university, good degree. But at that time, it was like, it was pretty hot. It was, I think mining engineering graduates were sort of commanding the highest salaries across all 
disciplines or among the highest anyway. So while I'm studying, I'm sort of transitioning out of those old jobs from phase zero, which was like the, the call center jobs. I worked that for a while and then I got a job doing work experience related to mining. And this was in the city in Sydney. And I was working for a company that did mining software. And I basically did nothing in that job. They just paid me. I think they just wanted to have someone around who was like a university student. Again, at this time, my industry was booming. And so as a, even before you were a graduate, you were, you're in demand. Um, so I did nothing for this company, got paid money. And then over summer, I would go and work in the mines. And that was really good money, actually. The first one I did was like $30 an hour. And then the second year I did it, which was the place that I ended up working at, it paid like $50 an hour, something crazy as a student. And so I enjoyed that a lot. I, I saved a lot of the money. I spent a lot of it on traveling and you know that was what funded my first trips overseas. And since each mine site that I worked at would normally take a bunch of students over the summer at once, um, I made a lot of really good friends. And so that period of time was really quite enjoyable. So I was saving money from that. And as well, while I was studying throughout university, I didn't mention before, but I, I used to be really passionate about photography. I still am passionate about photography, but I don't practice it as a hobby anymore. But I, I used to spend lots of time just going out, taking photos, landscape photos, but I really love the technical aspect, the gear as well, actually cameras and lenses. And one day I, I would buy them secondhand because I was still a student, I was saving money, I was budgeting, remember I had those goals that I was trying to achieve. And so I wasn't, I wasn't really buying anything new. Um, I was just buying stuff off eBay and off Gumtree, which is just like Craigslist, um, but it's in Australia. So I was buying these lenses and then I discovered one day that when I actually sold it back on the same marketplace, I think it was eBay, I made $50 on this used lens. So I'd taken it on a holiday, used it, abused it, you know, thrown it in the back of my bag. It was in worse condition than when I bought it. And I sold it to this guy and he paid me 50 bucks more than what I'd paid for it. So I'd made a $50 profit. And that was the start of my entrepreneurial career. When I could discover that literally I could take a simple product like, like this lens, this is a Canon, uh, this is a Sony lens, sorry, but the lenses I used to use buy and sell were Canon mainly. When I could take that, this product and then sell it on for a profit when I didn't actually do anything to it. I mean, I discovered arbitrage basically, but it was really just vivid. And I, I really, really enjoyed that mainly because I enjoyed the actual lenses so much. So I would buy them off eBay. Um, at first, not in any scientific process, methodical way. Uh, I would just, you know, log on eBay. I would just buy something. And over time, I got to get a better and better feel for the market as it was and like, which lenses were priced well, which were bad. So I was flipping those cameras or trading or arbitrage, whatever you want to call it. I started that when I was still a student, um, you know, got those other jobs, did the vacation work. And then I graduated and got a good job. It was in Australian dollars, it was a six figure salary, which, you know, is really high for a starting graduate. In US dollars, I think, depending on the exchange rate, that's around about six figures. I uh, got that job. As the industry, like I said, was, was just coming into a downturn, and pretty quickly discovered that I didn't really like it. Uh, I didn't like anything about the career. Like I said, I had just done it because it paid the best as much as I would say all of these other reasons. If it had paid less, I never would have gone into it. And then I realized that even paying what it did pay, it wasn't worth it to me to be in that career. As I was getting now into this career that I had started w without really knowing what I was getting myself into um, and recognizing that I needed to start looking for other things, something else that was gonna be more satisfying to me. So I was definitely willing to, you know, the, the whole six figure salary thing was, I discovered it was overrated, at least for me. Like I was happy to take a pay cut to do something that I would enjoy more, or I would like to earn money if I was gonna go through the same sort of pain and just like dissatisfaction. So I was looking at these other things and the cameras which I'd been arbitraging and selling, I started doing that more. So I, you know, I was tracking these things and I have the spreadsheet up, I'm looking at it right now. And this was really the foundations of like my Amazon business, I suppose. I had this like stock management spreadsheet. I was tracking the amount of inventory that I was holding, um, my profit margin, how much I was making. And I had, you know, like item by item. So I had like a stock keeping system and everything. That was one side hustle was doing that manually. And then this is where I started to just go down the rabbit hole, which I, I think a lot of cases, like you have to do this if you want to go from a certain trajectory to a, a better trajectory or one that works better for your life is to start trying things. And so one of my ideas now was to automate that process. Instead of me going onto eBay, checking it manually, just scrolling through all of these products and like using my head to work out which ones were good and not, uh, I figured if I could automate that, then you know maybe I could scale it. Maybe if I could do it not just on eBay Australia, if I could work out some way of doing this 
like in different marketplaces as well, then that could be a full-time income. Um, decided to do a programming course. I enrolled in an EDX course, they're free courses. They basically take like top universities and you can learn from the materials without actually going there in person and it's free. In the end, the coding project didn't work out for my original aim. I made less money using that app. Um, I actually did end up getting an app uh, and it would, rather than me searching eBay, it would search eBay for me every like five minutes or something. It had a database that I, that I set up with pricing and everything in it. So it would identify products for me and then I would just click buy. I still had to do all the other stuff myself, you know, um, pick the item up, take the photos, sell it and, and do all of that myself as well. But at least that, that first process, I'd automated it. It didn't work out. I made less money doing that than selling manually, as I said, but the project was kind of a success. I'd shown that I could work, put in hours after work and get something out of it. So I was doing all of these different things. I was selling cameras. I was making shitty investments. I was looking at different careers. So either a small change or a big change, just something different. I looked at being a photographer. Um, I looked at becoming a data scientist. And then all the other career choices that I was looking at, I kind of realized would just be more of the same and maybe for more money or maybe for less money. Like my real problem was that I just didn't like being told what to do. I wanted to do something for myself. And so it had to be some sort of active business where I could put in my time, build something up that would then generate me money rather than me just clocking in every day and trading money for time. So the next idea was a used car dealership. So I went in, into this as a partnership with another person. So I won't talk too much about it because of because it involves somebody else. In this case, I learned how to hire my first virtual assistant. So we hired her using upwork.com. And for us, she was doing some bookkeeping stuff. She was doing just number crunching um, for database stuff that we were doing. But like the fact that I could go on in my bedroom, in my pajamas, I could go on to Upwork or any other website for, for freelancers, find somebody, hire them for $4 an hour and get them to do good work for whatever I could direct them to do was just mind blowing. And when I thought about it, this freelancer that I just hired for $4 an hour could probably do most of my job that I was getting paid $50 an hour to do. And yet like, nobody realized that this was the case. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to time it perfectly. I could, didn't get to the point of having you know this business model where I could use all of these things that I'd learned um, and all of these things that I'd tried and the skills that I'd, that I'd been building at the same time as having a stable income to back me up. So I went through a bit of a low point. It was just some, some personal issues and I was kind of feeling, I was pretty depressed and I knew that like I just, I couldn't take it anymore. So I quit my job. I threw away, it was six years of university of studying and four years of work. And then I entered the next phase. So at this point, I decided to pretty much go hard or go home. And this is three years ago now from today. And that's when I set this goal for myself to ideally have $1 million in net worth before I turn 30 um, or to be a millionaire. And I know that like that's just a number, it's arbitrary, but what that really meant was the freedom to be able to travel and do the things that I loved um, the freedom to be able to hopefully be able to take care of my family if they ever need the money to be able to help them out and to do that from a position of power and from abundance. So it was all of those things. And I did, you know, wrap it up in the number, but that's really what it meant. So I heard about Amazon FBA way before I started, like maybe back in 2015 or even 2014. Um, I knew one person who had gone to my high school. We weren't really close friends, but I'd seen through his Facebook and his social media that he was selling on Amazon. He was selling on Amazon successfully, making a lot of money doing it. And then he was starting to teach other people as well. And this is all the way back in, I think it was 2015. I didn't do anything with it, even though at that time I had been looking at business ideas and I'd been trying to find something that, you know, in the end, Amazon fit the bill perfectly. So this was three years ago, I had quit my job, I had no income, I did have those savings and I was focused on the car dealership at this stage. Now, a, a few things happened and I realized that that wasn't going to be the thing either. So it was really a matter of, well, what's next on the list? and. The way that I normally decide these things is just by going to our old friend Google and I Googled how to make money online. And it was basically the same list that you'd see today. It was like Amazon FBA, dropshipping, you know, blogging and affiliate marketing, things like that. Uh, and I just looked at them all and I had decided on Amazon FBA because I mean, firstly, I knew at least one person who was doing it. So I knew that like, it, you know, it wasn't completely a scam. Something existed there. Um, so I'd, I'd seen that and it required capital. And I had money, I had money saved up because I've been working for so long and saving that money. So I decided to go all in with it and I wasn't just gonna launch one product, I was gonna launch three and I even had two more in backup as well. So I was like, I was geared to go. Again, like I'd already quit my job, I had the money, I had already gone through that whole mental process of the fear and 
just the anxiety of what could go wrong. And I accepted the worst case. So if I knew that I, if I lost all of that money, I was just gonna go traveling. I still had enough savings to go traveling afterwards. I, uh, I set my goals low. I wanted $5 profit per product. I wanted each product to sell five units a day and you know, to have three products. And then I said like my long-term game plan was to have five products doing that. And what's that? So that's five, $25 per product profit per day times five, that's $125 profit per day across the business of five products. And times that per year, that's you know forty to $50,000, something like that. And I looked at that amount of money and I figured I could do it online from my computer. I didn't have to fly to work. I didn't have to go to a mine site. I didn't have to work with people that I didn't like. I didn't have to talk to people that I didn't like because I'm a really introverted person. I could do this all on my own terms. I could travel the world while doing it. I was like, hell yeah, like 40 grand a year to do that. That sounds awesome. So with those three products, I was trying a different approach with each one. And I was really just applying that same mental thought process that I've been doing this whole time with all of these different side hustles, uh, now going all in on this one. But it was just like, I know that I only need to find one thing that works. And once that one thing works, then you just do that again and again and again. So I had these three different approaches. First one failed. I have a case study about that. That's a, one of my first videos that's up here. It's a good one, you should watch it. The second one also didn't do too well. I ended up dropping that, but it did make some money. And the third one did take off. Um, now around this time that I was launching these products, again, I had pretty much cut all ties to my career. Um, I realized that there was nothing keeping me in Australia. So this is, as I was launching these products, I moved overseas, uh, I moved to Colombia and then as I was in Colombia, actually, I remember I was rock climbing in a place called La Mesa de los Santos, and there wasn't much reception there. And I had to go to the cliff edge and like hold my phone up to get reception. And I was sort of checking my first sales as they were coming in on this like cliff edge while I was rock climbing. And already then I was like, oh crap, like this actually works. Again, the first and second products were duds, but this third one coming into, it was coming into November and December into Q4, which is this crazy time, particularly for that product, the third one. And it went from like five sales a day to 10 and it just kept going up. And I ended up peaking, it didn't stock out for a while. I had plenty of stock, but it ended up peaking close to a hundred units a day. And this is going from having no job, no income to this product that was very profitable, very, very profitable for this first order. I, it was something like 200% ROI. So I had already paid off those other two products instantly. or well, not instantly, but you know, in a month or something. And it was very overwhelming at that time because I had just done all these things that I've been waiting years to do and years of trying and not really getting anywhere. And again, this goal of becoming a millionaire before I was 30 in, in less than three years had never really seemed like an attainable goal, but I just put it there to, to, for something to strive towards. And then December, 2016, my second month of selling, uh, it was 20, we sold 20 something thousand. And then in January, we sold around about 30,000. And that's when I knew I could do it. I could, I could see this. Suddenly I was already earning more than what I had been in my career job, which was six years of study, four years of work. And then I just surpassed it. it I didn't know whether it was sustainable, whether I could continue surpassing it and continue growing. But there's this feeling that you get when you make your first sale, the, the very first dollar that you make online which again, I'd made through those arbitrage sales is, is the best feeling. And when you do that with each new business model or each new idea, the first time, the first dollar that you make just hits home how, how real it is. And now I was making a lot of dollars every day and it was crazy. So I finished that climbing trip, went back to my apartment in Medellin in Colombia and I made big plans. So January of that year, I did around about 30,000 and I recognized that there was just no obstacles to scaling that, to really greatly increasing that. If I worked for a bit, it wasn't like arbitrage where I wasn't adding value. And so probably the margins would you know, be, be thin and really be compressed. Uh, I didn't have to deal with the products. I didn't have to do any logistic stuff. The market itself was America, so it was huge. I could just see it. And I'd already made lots of money. I'd already made more money than what I was making before in my old job. And so I said, fuck it. I'm gonna go big. I'm gonna make this year my year of actually going big, finally. And so I wanted to go from $30,000 in January to $300,000 in December. And I set $300,000 for two reasons. Firstly, it was 10 times where I'd started. So I, thinking in terms of 10 times was something I'd never been able to do before. 
um, you know, when you, when you have a job, it's like, oh, a 3% pay rise. Woohoo. So thinking in terms of a thousand percent was just mind boggling, but I had the confidence that I could do it. That was the first reason. And then the second reason was ego related. Um, $300,000 in sales at the profit margins I was getting was around about 30%. So 30% of 300,000 is 100,000. That's in US dollars. And again, like I said, my salary before was around about 100 US, 100,000 US dollars. And I just had this like idea. I just wanted to like, it was, it was for my ego. I wanted to earn what I had earned in the year previously in one month. So I set that as my goal and then I got to work. I knew that I just had to keep launching products. And so that strategy that I pretty much formed back then based off that one product that worked, I kept trying to fly under the radar. So it was the same thing. I wanted to go below what other people were looking at, go below that and then create some sort of a unique product, something that didn't exist or an improvement. So I knew that I just had to keep doing that over and over again. Each product was, you know, on average making me whatever it was, 10, $15,000 per year. I got 10 of them, that's $100,000. And it's pretty easy to launch products, um, particularly because I was just, it was expanding out. I had one thing that worked or actually a couple of things that worked now because I was continually launching products and, and I just had to keep doing that. So at the start, it was just me, but I mean, I was already at the $30,000 a month mark. So it was already worthwhile to outsource something. And the most obvious thing to outsource was customer service. So I actually hired the VA that I had been working with me before, the very first one that I'd ever hired. Um, I brought her back on just to do the customer service. And that was just an interim thing. Like she was going to study her masters of accounting. Um, but you know, that already just reduced the workload enough so that I could just look at getting more and more products. It didn't, I, I went to 30,000 and then it actually went down. Um, you know, I ran out of stock, a whole bunch of things happened. And I was just learning these lessons as I went. Like Amazon is really, really cash flow intensive. I was, again, whether it was lucky or whether it was my actual decisions that did it, whatever the case was, that first product was so profitable that it paid off, you know, the losing products and it gave me the cash to immediately reinvest. Uh, but it still took a long time and I had stock issues with that product. And so like everything was slowing down a bit and I went down for a few months. And then another product that I launched earlier in the year took quite a few months for it to sort of find its feet. And then it just kicked into gear. Uh, and I don't really know why it did, but I've learned that a lot of the time you don't and you don't know all the time which one is gonna hit, which one's not gonna hit. And so you just wanna take, make as many bets as possible basically. But this product now took off and I had my first thousand dollar profit um, day in July or August of that year. And at this point I was like on top of the world. I was traveling around the world. I was living with my best mate. I was in really good shape because I was using all of that free time to then go and just work out. I was single and just enjoying being a bachelor um, and making more money than I ever had before. It was this incredible feeling. I did realize that as I was trying to launch more and more products, I was working more and more. So I realized that if I wanted to hit that goal of the $300,000 a month, make my annual salary in a month type thing, um, I had to hire more help. And so that VA, the previous VA had already gone. I hired another one to do the customer service, but then I thought it was time to bring on like a full VA to really help me out. Um, I don't know if I'm the most efficient with, with like outsourcing and I think I create too much work, more work than there really needs to be. Cause I know some people can get, create, you know, much larger businesses than what I was creating at the time without the help of a full-time VA. But I made that call. I hired the first full-time VA that I'd ever had, my first ever full-time employee in September of that year. And he really helped me get through that, um, that Q4 period. And I did it. I actually exceeded my goal. Instead of making 300,000, like I had planned to, I made uh, 320 or so. And I you know, made more profit than I was expecting to as well, but it actually sucked. This doesn't make any sense at all until you go through this and you realize, but I had actually found that the, the period of time leading up to achieving that big goal, that huge goal that I'd set at the start at, in January, I really did not enjoy my life in those last couple of months. And in fact, as I reached up to that period where I was making way more money than I had ever made in my life, uh, I wasn't really that happy. It was actually a kind of numb feeling where I achieved the goal and then had to start thinking about well, what was next. And I didn't, I didn't spend the money on anything because I still had this in the background. I was still that, that budget save, you know, like save all of this money that the money didn't come back to me in like pleasurable terms. I didn't give it to anyone or do anything good with it. I didn't give myself, you know, treats or nice experiences, whatever you want to call it. So I actually felt quite empty when I achieved that goal, which is silly to say, but that's, that's what happened. So I knew that there was something there. I was, you know, making really good money. I had all of this potential. I'd had 
for most of that year, I had felt like I was the king of the world. Like everything was just going great. The, the business was doing what I wanted it to do, which was to help my life um, and achieve that freedom that I had had always been wishing for basically. So I'd done that in a really short period of time. But at the same time, I knew that if I was pushing myself so hard to get more and more income by just working really hard, that last part wasn't really worth it for me. And so when I went into 2018, when I went into last year, I really tried to change tack a little bit. And and I think this is actually what the, the single thing that contributed the most to me becoming a millionaire was changing my thinking. Um, because I could have done that again this year with Amazon, but I was really conscious of like arriving at that millionaire mark, but but it not being worth the sacrifice, if that makes sense. So I planned my 2018 in a similar fashion, like just take a few weeks off work I, is what I would do. And, you know, not think about anything except for the longer term goals. So it's the end of the year. It's years away. Like, what do I want to be doing that's actually going to help me get to really where I want to be? I still had the millionaire goal. Um, but like I said, like there were other, there had to be other things on top of that as well. So this time I went to an island called Providencia. I disconnected from the internet and I started to think what that would look like. And what it ended up looking like was I was still going to improve the business. I wasn't going to go for a 10 times goal, which would be much harder to achieve at basically going from the seven to the eight figure level in one year. But I thought I could double it from 1 million in total sales to 2 million approximately. Um, which would be from 300,000 to 600,000 in that month of December. But I didn't want to be as involved in that process. I wanted to be doing something that was more closely related to my purpose, if you will. And I didn't even really know what my purpose would be. But I had discovered that again, it was the same process of like, if you don't know what the answer is, do things until you find the answer. Just do stuff. Like don't sit around waiting for it to happen or waiting for it to happen to you because it never does. You have to go and like, whether it's Amazon products, you're looking for the hit, try three, one will hit, the other two don't matter. If it's, you know, if it's business models, try three, two will fail, the one that works will be the one that you stick with. And so in this case, I wanted to find out like, not what my purpose is, but to get closer to that. And that is kind of how this came about. So I figured there would be two potential approaches which I could take. One would be to hire more VAs and to basically go through that same process I'd gone through with the first VA, which is with each thing that you're doing in your business, you just do it enough times until you know step-by-step step what to do. And then you write that down. As you're doing it, you write it down and then you can give that to somebody and then get them to do it and just tweak. And as they do it, you know, over and over again, you adjust the instructions, you give them feedback and they become better and better at that task. Um, so I could do that with more tasks, more VAs, or I could, train someone up in the thinking, the entrepreneurial type skills. That was the approach I went with. So I actually had been talking to somebody on Reddit of all places for a while, and he ended up becoming my manager. I hired him, um, his name is Michael. And I don't know, one day I'd like to get him on the channel, but for the last year then, so for 2018, my goal really was not to work in the business. It was to train Michael up to be me as much as possible. and. I would say that this has been a long work in progress. Like hiring VAs takes about twice as long as you expect it to do for it to actually pay off. Just the training process tends to take longer, costs more money, all of that. Um, and hiring someone at a higher level as well, like at a manager level, it's exactly the same. Um, so that has been like a year long process. But always, again, my idea has just been like, what is the worst case? And if the worst case eventuates, Am I okay with it? And in this case, it was like, I'm gonna help this guy out. He wants to be an entrepreneur. I can pay him good money. I can teach him everything I know. And you know, at the end of the day, if it doesn't help my business, at least he will have gained something from it. And if it doesn't work for the business, at least I'll know that next time, if I wanna hire someone to think for me or to replace me, like I need to do that differently. But anyway, we follow the exact same process. We just kept launching products that were flying under the radar. They were, you know, what I call singles or doubles. So generally doing like $5,000 a month in revenue as an average um, and then seasonal in Christmas and just providing enough differentiation that they would stand out. And on average, these products do well. They make money, they're reliable. And I was, we were able to grow our business from 1 million to 2 million just following this exact same strategy. And more importantly as well, I was able to free up my time. So it took a while, like I said, but from around July onwards, 
I was able to drop my, my hours route right down. So for the last six or seven months, I've been working essentially the four hour work week on my Amazon business. It's passive. It's 10 to 20 hours a month. And I don't have to physically be there doing stuff on the business. It runs without me. That is another key realization is that you can do this, but generally it's either going to take really good systems and processes, or it's going to take people, people that you need to hire, people that you need to train, people that you need to keep motivated. Um, and, and that is an art in and of itself. And that's an art that, you know, I'm no expert at, but I am learning it day by day. So now that I had this passive income generating business, making me more money than I had ever really dreamed of ever actually being able to achieve. And I was well on the path to becoming a millionaire in under three years before the age of 30. What then do I do with all that free time? Do I kick back? Do I just go to the beach, start sipping martinis? Uh -uh. So I had seen YouTube as a potential opportunity, a business opportunity, a potential project for quite a while. When I started selling on Amazon, there wasn't much on YouTube. And then in 2017, a couple of big YouTubers kind of really quickly came on the scene and made a lot of money selling courses. Starting a YouTube channel really appealed to me for a lot of reasons. First of all, having multiple sources of income. Um, starting an Amazon business is incredibly gratifying, incredibly rewarding financially and otherwise, but it's scary as well. You put all of your eggs in one basket and I willingly do that, but I know that there is risk involved in that. And so having other sources of income to diversify that, it's just smart thinking. And the idea of being able to do that while at the same time talking about something that I know a lot about, sharing information that genuinely can help other people because I had spent a lot of time talking to other people when I first started my Amazon business, but they were people that I knew in real life, people who were, were nine to fivers and still are. And the mindset is different. If somebody isn't ready to do these things, the information is lost on them. And I had realized that I was wasting my time. They probably didn't want to hear about what I was talking about anyway. And so if I wanted to talk about it, if I wanted to help somebody, you know, I had to find new people to, to, to get out there and, and be able to interact with. And so it just ticked all of these boxes. I said, I'm gonna do this no matter what for six months, I'm gonna do around about 50 videos. And if that doesn't work, then I can quit, but I cannot quit until then. So I'm here, this is around about video 46 and just on the one new mark, I guess I'll let you be the final judge of whether all that hard work has paid off. Uh, if you are watching this and you're still here and you are appreciating this content, then definitely just leave me a comment down below. Say thank you or something like that so that I know that you get something out of these videos. So that's really the three year timeline of events where I started and I set my goal to become a millionaire. And then now with the Amazon business doing on average throughout the year around about $35,000 in profit per month uh, and the YouTube channel or the FBA Freedom Accelerator doing between 20 to $30,000 a month. That's how I've been able to achieve that goal in less than three years and become a millionaire. Now that's who I am today. And it's funny to look back and actually see what's changed and what hasn't changed. I still travel pretty cheap. I do spend a lot more money on hotel rooms. Uh, this is, we're in the Bahamas right now. And so everything's really expensive. So I, I'm still getting like the cheapest Airbnb that I can find. But in general, like when I go to the supermarket, I'm still <laughs> buying the cheapest oats I can find, like home brand, because it's like 30 days worth of breakfast for like $2, come on. And you know that the only thing that I'm gonna get at Subway is the $5 sub of the day. But I know that that attitude, that's not the thing that made me a millionaire. Doing that, that budgeting, that saving on, on the cost side, on the expenses, that is kind of just a holdover. Like it's good to have that and to not live above your means because you can always do it whether you have an income of $1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 a month, you can always just exceed that very easily. But I know that scraping expenses away from an already reasonable budget, that's not gonna make you rich overnight. That's not gonna make you rich ever. And it's really about focusing on those scalable business ideas, that, that'll get you 99% of the way there, but doing that and then actually taking action, like not being afraid to go and try things and make the mistakes, recognizing that the one that works will pay off all of the mistakes that you make. And everything you learn from every mistake always does carry forward to the next thing. But I do wanna say that having gone from being the guy earning $100 a day and then being the guy earning $1,000 a day and then not on average, but at some points earning $10,000 a day those points are all, they sound so different, but there really is no difference. Like the person earning the hundred dollars a day is the same person earning a thousand dollars a day, same person earning 10,000 or a hundred thousand dollars in a day. Uh, I know what that feels like. And the only difference is the systems and the processes behind that person. So the person earning, if, if you earning a hundred dollars a day, you could be the person earning a thousand dollars a day. The only thing is that if you're earning a hundred dollars a day, you're putting in your time for money. You're trading your time directly in a linear relationship for money. If you're earning $1,000 a day, 
You could still be doing that, but more likely you have built something that works behind you, a business idea of some sort or a business model that generates income when you're not working. And if you are earning $10,000 a day, you built a business. You have systems, you have processes. Those things are working when you're not working. So if that's you, then just realize that you don't have to be somebody else. You don't have to be somebody smarter or somebody um, you know, with better connections or with more experience or a better environment, none of that. You need to be you and then just work on building up a system or a business or something, something that will take your time out of the equation. Uh, Amazon FBA has been the main one for me and whatever you may choose, I hope that it works out for you. That's really all I wanted to share. That is the story of how I got to achieving this goal, um, this milestone that I'm really proud of, becoming a millionaire. Hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to subscribe and click the notification bell if you haven't already done so. I wasn't extremely specific with the numbers in this video, so I'm gonna leave a link to my last income report. So I, I transparently share my income from various sources and you can see what that looks like. I'm clicking wherever this video is on the screen now, I'm gonna link it up here. Go click that and if you wanna see all the breakdowns, profit margins, everything, I share it all. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one.